What's next for a neighborhood under siege? We'll have to wait and see. Reporting live, Sadie Sinclair, Channel 7 News. This is San Francisco. Welcome back to Sad Francisco. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, you're wondering who the hell is this talking right now? This is Antoshio. And you're right. My name is Tofu. If you didn't know already, I'm the editor for the podcast. I'm recording the intro for Toshio this week since he unfortunately got COVID, which ironically relates to the topic of this week's episode. Believe it or not, COVID still exists, even if politicians pretend it's not real or just a non-issue. Through wastewater testing, we know there's quite a bit of corona going around right now. Jillian Crochet, who works with San Francisco's own Senior and Disability Action, is going to talk about where the city is at with COVID and why the group wants to push the SF Department of Public Health to a requirement for medical workers in the city to wear masks while they're at work, attending to patients at hospitals and doctor's offices across the city. As of now, the requirement expires on April 30th, and there's going to be an action on Tuesday, April 16th. Info for that will be linked in the show notes. If you like the podcast and want to support us, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash sadfrancisco. The money we raise helps pay for the labor and different equipment and programs we use to make the show happen. Special shout out to our patrons, J.E., Ethan, and Leah from Sour Cherry Comics. If you want to see additional content from us, you can follow us on our Instagram at sadfrancis.co. That's S-A-D-F-R-A-N-C-I-S dot C-O. Toshio has been doing a wonderful job posting additional content and reels to promote some short stories or different headlines that aren't really long enough for full-length episodes. Go ahead and follow us there to support additional content as well. That's it for me. Now on to Toshio and Jillian for this week's episode. Jillian, thank you for being here on the podcast. Really appreciate it. We were talking a little bit earlier about how I just got COVID for the first time, at least to my knowledge, after testing yesterday, finding out that I had COVID and I am feeling shitty, but I felt like this topic was pretty important given my own personal circumstances. I didn't want to push it back. I'm also like getting kind of bored <laughs> because of the uh, <laughs> the isolation that is necessary. But yeah, Jillian like wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with this project. It's a campaign to get people who are medical workers to start wearing masks again. Right. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Toshio. I think it's important to note that you need to rest as much as possible. And that includes like mental resting. So I'll try and do like the heavy lifting here. And appreciate it. (laughs) It's hard to rest in this current ecosystem, and it's just not something that capitalism allows us to do well and society, and we just don't know how to do it, and it's really hard to do it. But yeah, just try really hard to rest. I guess don't try really hard because then that's like not resting, but, but, you know, just be gentle with yourself because studies have shown even like mentally resting can sometimes prevent long COVID. Uh, Um, Good to know. Yeah. So I'm Jillian Crochet and I am a disabled artist in the Bay Area. And I've been doing work with SDA a little over a year now, maybe, or around a year. I got involved because it seemed kind of like the Bay Area stopped masking. Everybody, I guess, got cramped up because of all the rain. I'm not really sure. You know, everywhere else had already kind of abandoned masking. And I was like, oh, yeah, we're doing great in the Bay Area. And then it was kind of like everybody stopped masking and all of the community spaces that I was 
part of the art community spaces, stop requiring masks. And so I was just completely shut out of my community and it was like really isolating and I felt really hopeless and lonely. So I was like, well, I need to find some people who share my reality. COVID is dangerous and deadly and we don't want to catch it. We need to practice community care and protect include those of us who are most vulnerable and marginalized. And I don't think we should just be shuttered away to live for the rest of our lives in our apartments. So through the internet, there's been several groups on Signal and Facebook organizing disabled people or just COVID cautious people in the Bay Area and globally. And so I started joining lots of groups and trying to find people who were like-minded. And I found SDA and haven't really looked back. It's felt really important and powerful and a lot more hopeful, even when sometimes it feels like it's still kind of an impossible feat. I think we've had a few wins collectively. And so that feels really good. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying around belonging in a world that honestly wants disabled people dead in a lot of cases with things like the discouragement of masks almost. I remember back to when our mayor, London Breed, was being heralded as this big hero around public health and COVID. And then, you know, she proceeded to show up to the French Laundry, this really expensive restaurant in Napa, maskless, while she was telling everyone else that they needed to be masks. And then likewise, she went to a New Year's party and she decided to go maskless People took some pictures, you know, it was showing like this kind of hypocrisy around what she was doing in public eye normally. And then, of course, this comes out. And then you did see like San Francisco go the way of a lot of other parts of the country with like now there seems to be a total void of information around COVID. So I mean, on that topic, I was wondering if you could describe a little bit how how COVID is still a thing in San Francisco in 2024. How is it still affecting us in 2024, four years later? Yeah, there's a lot. A lot. Like, I remember how scandalous, like, some of these early incidents were. And, like, I could talk to any progressive person in the Bay Area and like be in camaraderie with like, oh my God, I can't believe they were unmasked or whatever. And we would share shock and horror. Right. But it's a hard thing to face. And it's like living in this kind of collective dissonance yeah. that that like it's it's really hard to keep believing that COVID is a problem. Because the messaging we're receiving is that it's not a problem. You know, you can't go have dinner out at a restaurant and still be afraid to get COVID. You know, practice precautions against getting COVID. So, like, I think it's really hard to live with this reality, but it it is there. And, you know, our government has shown over and over that they can't be trusted. So, like, why would we trust the CDC or the government, Donald Trump or Joe Biden to tell us the truth about COVID? And I think one of the more recent taking away of precautions was that you no longer need to stay home if you're sick with COVID in California, maybe. And they're like, everybody's passing the buck, so to say, like, state of California is like, 
like, well, you know, this we have to follow the CDC guidelines and the Bay Area SF Department of Public Health is like, well, we have to follow the California guidelines and individual systems that we've we've been advocating for a while now hard to get UCSF to re-implement universal masking. And they're like, oh, you know, we have to follow what the SF Department of Public Health says. And the SF Department of Public Health is like, oh, well, you know, individual um, healthcare facilities to make mandates. So nobody's taking the reins, so to speak, and protecting people. Placing the onus on like the vulnerable and chronically ill community. And they're like, well, you can mask if you want to, but like one way masking is not enough. It's been shown in many, many settings and it's more important for the person with COVID to wear a mask because even with a super well fitting mask, it's possible to catch COVID and it's like really, really hard to know whether or not you have a well-fitting mask. Not saying that that should keep you from trying to wear a well-fitting mask. Conversely, of course, you know, masks are are a good way to combat COVID. But yes, masks are definitely important for the most important ways to mitigate the spread of COVID. But universal masking is important and one of the things we're asking for just kind of like go back a little bit like we're calling on the san francisco department of public health to keep in place health order 2023-01b which requires that personnel in healthcare settings wear masks this health order is a crucial production for the San Francisco community amid the ongoing pandemic. It's set to expire on April 30th of this year. So at the end of the month, it's unacceptable. And we're also asking that the SF Department of Public Health it will strengthen the health order through needed public health measures such as universal masking requirements in healthcare and jail settings, as well as requiring and providing high quality masks. Because the science is clear that masks help control the spread of COVID-19, but it's not enough to leave it up to individual patients to choose to wear a mask. It's far safer when everyone involved in the interaction is wearing a mask. And it's relatively impossible to go to the doctor and wear right now where everybody is mass except for i think at sf general they still have a universal masking policy that's but, correct yeah but like it's way more likely and it's it's at ucsf they're still requiring healthcare personnel to wear masks you know i'm a ucsf patient myself and whenever i go into any of the facilities, there are a ton of unmasked people, and it's just really dangerous to get for me to go get health care that I need to like stay alive. Yeah, we were hoping that SFDPH will keep the bar high by requiring personnel in healthcare settings to wear the mask, but we also are urging them to include universal masking in San Francisco, actually, which is overall in the U.S., the wastewater levels. One of the ways that we can still kind of track COVID now, because, you know, Hospitals aren't reporting. We aren't sure what's being reported, who's being reported, who is reporting. And I think that wastewater levels we can kind of track, but we can't know for sure how many people are like really dying from COVID anymore because that reporting ended last year. And yeah, 
still in the U.S., even though rates are lower, there's still a thousand new COVID deaths each week in the U.S. And actually in San Francisco, the wastewater COVID levels are increasing again. I think I want to say I did it yesterday and it seemed like it was almost double over the course of a week. So that might be a reason why you find yourself infected with COVID right now. Yeah, I just looked at like there's a COVID Bay Area wastewater measure that the Chronicle has up where they just take data from the local wastewater scan research. And looks like right now we have a medium to high parts per million of COVID samples found in wastewater compared to a lot of other places in California. That's not great. But yeah, I mean, it's it's helpful to know. I mean, the thousand people dying each week, did you say? Yeah. For the- I mean, that's incredible. That's with, you know, the lack of reporting that we're facing right now. It's still that high, the, you know, confirmed deaths. And that's You know, I think a lot of people will know this, but it's like, you know, more than most diseases that are tracked in the U.S. Like number three, I think, with like all of heart diseases, number one or two, and then all cancers. It's incredible. (laughs) So it's just like, it's kind of unreal how many people are being affected by this and how like little it seems that the government seems to care and other people like how little of precautions people are taking. Right. Yeah. That it's become such a political sort of issue rather than like a public health issue is really maddening. And I was wondering, you know, who are the people that need to feel the most pressure around, you know, getting this campaign to work, making sure that we do have universal masking in places where people receive health care. Who are the people that need to hear this the most? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to like go back and also add that like according to CDC, there's currently 17.6 million Americans who are currently living with long COVID which is a lot. And we also don't know like how many people are dying from the complications due to long COVID. Like that's not in our numbers, but that is mass disablement because long COVID is a disability and the ch- your chances increase like every time you get another COVID infection. So it's yeah. just, yeah. My, yeah, my brother has long COVID. My good friend has now a chronic thyroid issue that she has to go into the doctor and see the doctor every few months, an issue that she didn't have before she got COVID. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are so many stories that you hear and it feels like people aren't broadcasting as much when they have COVID or long COVID these days. Like for a while, people were being like really careful and telling all their friends and like posting it on Instagram if they had a positive COVID test. But it seems like people are doing that less and less, you know. If there are 17.6 million people, like you would think that we would know about it and hear about it more. But I think people are like maybe embarrassed or maybe they don't even realize they have long COVID. They're just like, everybody's got this cough. But, you know, long COVID is very much known for causing people to have like a really bad cough and lung issues later. But uh, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this makes me think I should probably go on Instagram and Twitter and yeah, just mention it in case like I happen to uh, pass by other people. Yeah. And that as well. Yeah. Just to make it so that it's not dirty little secret um, because it really shouldn't be. Yeah. We have to like normalize it. And it's just, you know, it's been, as you were saying before, it's just kind of like a blackout media wise and we just don't 
talk about it anymore, but it's like real and it's causing mass disablement and mass death. Yeah. Yeah. And not only the traditional media, I mean, social media as well. Like I have posted things to, I don't know, YouTube and TikTok. And in order to get these like shorts on YouTube or TikTok to get out to people, like you kind of have to hold back certain words that are related to COVID because there is censorship on these social media platforms around COVID because I guess they don't want to touch this issue that has become such a political issue. And so to get around some of these censors, you know, you have to like cloak the term COVID and basically use synonyms or lingo that is like specific to the online world, you know, misspell the COVID when you're typing intentionally so that the sensors maybe don't catch it if it's spelled a little differently. All these things that are so bizarre, but very, very 2024. Yeah, it's also very complicated. Yeah. And yeah, yeah no, and I, I get this. Some of it is around misinformation that's gone around around COVID, but That's why I think it's just important that people like you, I appreciate that you're keeping your eye on what is happening, especially locally with COVID. We talked about how general still does have masking in place, but that, you know, of course it could be improved that just having the policy doesn't necessarily I mean, you're going to have universal masking, but certainly if you don't give any guidance at all, uh, the situation is going to be much worse. So yeah, people don't listen to please wear a mask or mask strongly encouraged is almost a joke at this point. People don't take it upon themselves to do the things that they're supposed to do. I mean, but there are Plenty of rules and guidelines in place already in like hospitals to protect patients. Like doctors have to go through a very like rigorous hand washing procedure. Whenever they go into an OR, they have to wear a mask. You know, there are all sorts of rules in place in our society to protect other people, like, you know, not smoking indoors. That used to be a thing. You have to wear a seatbelt to protect you from like dying. It's not unheard of to have systems and guidelines and rules in place to like protect the health and lives of people. I think one of the things that we've been advocating with UCSF and a bunch of ways, I guess you would say, like UCSF, we've been working with the SF Department of Public Health and Dr. Susan Phillip, who is the health officer there. And, you know, they're like, it's too hard to enforce. And it's just like, it's not a good enough reason. Like, how do you enforce the doctors to wash their hands? Like, you know, just do it. And also they're like, oh, well, you know, it's, on individuals, which we've already talked about. And, you know, if people need a reasonable accommodation to ask their providers to wear masks, then they can do it. And healthcare professionals and the SF County Health Department would have you believe that medically vulnerable people can just ask for a reasonable accommodation and everything works out, but that process doesn't work. It's an impossible task after UCSF basically told us that we can't require universal masking, but people, you know, can ask for a reasonable accommodation. I was like, okay, I'll try it because I recently had a procedure at UCSF and I'm someone who is I used to self-advocacy because I am physically disabled and so I'm often having to like advocate about accessibility of buildings. I have to like talk 
to people about my need to be able to access bathrooms way more than I should. And so all this to say, like, I'm really used to self-advocacy. It's part of my art and it's just a daily part of my life. But trying to advocate for masking, I wanted the doctors and nursing staff who would be in the procedure room with me while I was unmasked. I wanted them to be wearing N95s. My number one request was to, after the procedure, to be put in a separate room from unmasked people. And they're like, oh, we can't do that because they have to keep a close eye on you. And I was like, okay, can you at least like put my N95 back on my face before I'm wheeled out of the procedure room? And it was just such a Sisyphean task. I had to advocate to like eight different people in like the week's And even the minutes leading up to the procedure, I didn't know whether or not they would take my needs seriously until like the very last second, right before they wheeled me into the procedure room. The nurses were like, almost like it was a secret. They're like, you want us to wear these? And like pulled the N95s out of their pockets. And I was like, yes, please. And so they went, put them on and then came back and got me. But I didn't know right up until the last minute and I was just like having to repeat over and over again I'm vulnerable to adverse effects negative outcomes due to COVID I need for you to wear N95s in the procedure room I need for you to keep me safe outside of the procedure room And it was, I had to repeat myself, I don't know, four or five times to all the different professionals, you know, the anesthesiologist came up to me and the doctor came up to me and the nurse. And one of the nurses was like, while she was there the entire time, I was talking to like the other nurse, I was talking to my different doctors and there was this one nurse who had a surgical mask that kept like falling below her nose. And I was just like, oh my God, this is impossible. And, you know, it's it's really hard for people to speak up like that. And like, I was still, I was still vulnerable because it was a small space and there were a ton of unmasked people. And there are like so many power dynamics at play. I I was super uncomfortable. Like I would consider myself an expert and I was still like nervous to like confront the nurse with the the nose hanging out of the mask because I was like, you have to be careful not to become like a problem as a disabled person. You can't like be seen as a problem or, you know, hysterical. And often like you can be ignored, you know, if you get in a confrontation with a medical assistant, they can prevent you from getting the care you need, like escalating it to your doctor or even asking your doctor. And You know, it's just like really impossible to ask that of the vulnerable population. Like you said, yeah, I mean, the power dynamics, they're not balanced. And if you're the one that is getting care, also, like you said, not everyone has as much experience as you do with advocating for themselves and what they need and asking for a safer situation as far as COVID goes. And, you know, you hope that in a place like a healthcare facility that you do have people around that have the needs of people who are more marginalized at the top of their minds. 
but it's just not always the case. And it does seem like, yeah, this is one thing that the requirement messaging from SFDPH to keep it in place beyond April 30th, it just seems like pretty obvious. But yeah, going back to the next question that I had, what are the major medical offices or SFDPH or hospitals that you're looking to target with this particular campaign? Yeah, so we're obviously SFDPH and Susan Phillip are who we're targeting right now. And Dr. Susan Phillip is the one who can lift the health order or enforce it or make it stronger. And then there's also some kind of body that consults with the SFDPH that includes people from all of the different healthcare facilities in the Bay Area, you know, just all the different power players in the Bay. And of that, UCSF is a very strong force. I think, and people in the Bay Area look to them, but also like across the country and kind of see them as influential to whether or not we take certain precautions or should take certain precautions. So that's why we have been advocating for UCSF to re-implement universal masking and disability justice writer Alice Wong has also been putting a lot of pressure on UCSF after a recent situation that she had when she had to go to the ER and was put at risk as well. And so, yeah, I think those are the main parties that we're trying to push for. Yeah, I just got to meet Alice at a a masked party. We live like a few minutes away from each other. It was cool to meet in person finally after all all this time. That is helpful. And I feel like we should just ask people to to go and make a move and, you know, get SFTPH to keep doing what they're doing around the requirements, you know, be a sort of, I guess, beacon where a lot of other health departments seem to have cowered in the face of politics around COVID. To that end, what's a way for people to go and support the campaign and also how to follow your work? Yeah, so the Instagram and the thing that used to be Twitter can be found at SD Action One is the name of Senior Disability Action. So that's SD Action One. It's the number one. And online at sdaction.org. We have A couple things you can do. We have a sign-on letter that we'll be presenting to Susan Phillip that a lot of organizations, including your podcast, have signed. And we're looking to get as many people as we can to sign on to that letter. And then the most urgent thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to have an action in front of SFDPH on Tuesday, April 16th from 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. And yeah, we encourage people to come and join us to help push SFDPH to make the right call and make healthcare safer. Right. Because yeah, it's just countless it's, disabled and chronically ill people can't leave their home without risking their lives. And we can't get the safe health care that we need. And so we need to push the government to do the right thing. Thank you so much, Jillian. We'll have more information about the action on Tuesday and the campaign as well in the show notes. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you for listening to San Francisco, which is produced by Toshio Moronic and edited by Tofu Estolas. 
If you have it, please throw us a few dollars through patreon.com slash sadfrancisco, which will help us pay for podcast hosting, editing, and transcriptions for the show. See you next time in San Francisco.